this movie was going to be the ultimate test to see if Marvel Studios had legs. Our little minds can handle big green rage monsters and billionaires making super suits, but the idea of an Aryan Norse god walking amongst us looking like that and talking like Laurence Olivier on his break, that's going to be a stretch. Thor had been something of a joke to many with his long golden locks and winged helmet, so whatever Marvel could do to help us take him seriously would be greatly appreciated. Funny enough, where it counted, Marvel made it work. I mean, come on, look who they picked to direct it. Kenneth Branagh is a first-class director in that he has directed some of the quintessential film adaptations of William Shakespeare, and he treated Thor with that same level of dedication and maturity, and yet still had room for the trademark humor. Getting the meh out of the way, this was one of Branagh's first forays into action, and I will say it shows. The action is entertaining and competently made, but honestly it's nothing to write home about. In fact, until the Avengers came along, I really can't think of an action sequence in the MCU up to that point that really blew my mind. Normally for a comic book movie, that would mean the movie is DOA, so why have they worked so well? Simple. We can see action anywhere, but here, in the MCU, we're guaranteed to see films that bring the characters we love to life and imbue them with personality and depth. It was clear Branagh wanted to focus on this intimate story of fathers and sons that just so happened to be set in an epic fantasy landscape. To his credit, while he's no John Woo when it comes to action, Branagh still creates a striking landscape with Asgard. I mean, look at this place. It is radiant. It is shining with utter majesty. I mean, look at that floor! How much floor wax do you think they go through to keep that floor looking so shiny? I could put my contacts in while checking to see if my fly is zipped. Multitasking! Meanwhile, you look at Jotunheim and... And there go my nipples again. Just looking at this place gives you chills and a sense of foreboding. I remember the first time Thor and company came here, I had this sincere feeling of being watched. It's an incredible achievement of design. And so competent is the design that even the silliest aspect of Asgard from the comics, the Rainbow Bridge, now mercilessly labeled the Bifrost, looks incredible. In the comics, that bridge in Asgard looked kind of like what Michael Jackson probably imagined Neverland Ranch looked like every time he came home. In the film, it looks new and ancient all at the same time. It looks like it has a power coursing through it. So, as great as the design is, it's still vital that the casting matches it. Now, Marvel has had no problem casting unpopular actors in the roles, so long as they're the right ones. While casting known prestigious actors like Robert Downey Jr. in lack of his bankability is a gutsy move, Casting an unknown, let alone many, that is a massive gamble. Apart from a very impressive few minutes in J.J. Abrams' Star Trek, no one knew who the hell Chris Hemsworth was at the time. And while yes, he did make a strong impression in those few minutes, could he shoulder the weight of his own franchise? As it turns out, not only was it a resounding yes, but this performance catapulted Hemsworth into superstardom and opened him up to taking a slew of prestige projects outside of the MCU. And it's fair to see why. Hemsworth goes through a variety of modes throughout the movie, going from brash, arrogant, angry, and then into humility, empathy, and ultimately heroism. And not just Captain Hammer heroism, I'm talking the one life over many is not worth it heroism. One thing I never appreciated about Thor until seeing this film was that his origins when compared to all the other Marvel heroes is a complete flip side. Where most superheroes gain greatness from small beginnings, Captain America being a definitive example, obtaining their powers and becoming a hero from their newfound strength, Thor is the complete opposite. He was born to greatness. He had grown accustomed to a life of privilege and power. When he was stripped of his powers and he learned the value of humility and sacrifice, very few superheroes have this distinction. Of course, for all the gorgeous scenery of Asgard, the film by necessity has to dip its toe into some mediocrity by throwing Thor into the bland landscape of the New Mexico desert. It makes sense to throw God into humble surroundings among simple, by comparison creatures, to knock a narcissist down a peg or two, but we've seen this landscape in many films before. It makes for some jarring tonal shifts between the grand and epic to a fish out of water comedy. That being said, they do handle the comedy relatively okay. Fish out of water premises have been played to highly cringeworthy levels, and this one opts to downplay the tongue in cheek awkwardness and make it benefit Thor's growth as a character. 
Now, a lot has been said about Jane Foster as a character, and a lot of it is hard to refute for me. In both movies, I found her to be delightfully quirky, and I always like how she constantly lets her thirst for scientific discovery overtake her common sense, aka Eric Selvig. Selvig senses this guy's nuts, Jane acknowledges the possibility, but also knows that there's compelling evidence of something more to Thor, and because she's the only one willing to help him, Thor's fondness for Jane is made evident as he makes an effort to help her in her endeavors. So, I always Doug Jane. And Natalie Portman, I have no real beef. Well, maybe some crumbs of ground chuck, but we'll get into that at a later time. I've already said a good amount about Loki in my close examinations of the MCU villains, so for more on that, visit that video. Nevertheless, it's still important to observe that he wasn't fully embraced by the masses until the Avengers, and that's really a pity because Loki in this film feels like the essential Loki and as far as you see the core of him. His envy of Thor, his desire to rule, his alienation made worse with the knowledge that he isn't even Asgardian. This is very compelling storytelling executed brilliantly by Tom Hiddleston. Even if Loki didn't take off as a character, you knew that from the merit of his performance in this film alone, Hiddleston was destined for greatness. By extension, the amount of attention put towards the family dynamic in this film is borderline Shakespearean, so it definitely leaves one to realize why Branagh was such a perfect choice to direct this movie, and how Marvel was legitimately trying to present even their more derided characters in a more inspiring light. The common complaint with heroes like Superman has always been, how do you emotionally connect with a god? Well, this film showed us how. <laughs> 